What's this? What's this? Unprofessional wrestling moments? No. Never. <laughs> Not in a million years. Wrestling? Never. Dude. All business. Every time. No There's ego. There's never been. Never an ego. No. Never a sour taste. Never a bad moment. Never a booker looking to make some other talent look good and, you know, lie to you. Basically. All honesty. Yeah, exactly. Never, you know, invite you to a show and, you know, forget to pay you at the end of the night and leave. Or promise you a belt and then you show up and you don't get it. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, <clears throat> speaking from experience here. Going through all the effort of getting them ready to go live on the internet whenever the hell they wanted to at any given time, setting up cameras, setting up infrastructure, setting up online uh, pathways and everything like that, training people to get them going on uh, how to get every, how to run the show and everything. And then uh, basically just completely forgotten about and just pushed out the door. Ne never happened. Never happened. No. Those of you who cannot see past our very well hidden sarcasm. Jesus Christ. The wrestling industry can sometimes be as dirty as an old oil rag. A used condom. I was trying to be a little more like... At a whorehouse. In the late 80s. Left on the dashboard in the sun and the heat. And swallowed by somebody with a spray tan. The end. Ugh. Animate that, motherfuckers. <laughs> And then, of course, you know, nowadays, you know, you have very, you have two big organizations yet again. And it looks like both One's of them, still in its infancy. But yet, in some ways, outdoing the product that it's trying to compete oh, with. Yeah. For instance, the quality of matches. There's no doubt. Okay, say what you will about WWE. Say about their production value. Again, their production is probably their biggest thing they have going for them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the people who are doing it have been doing it for, what, 20 plus years? So they know where to put the cameras. They know how to build stuff. And they also know how to build rings that actually explode and don't, you know, peter out with, like, sparklers and all that. Sorry, John Moxley, and sorry, Eddie Kingston, but that that was not a good ending to that match. It was a great match. I loved it, but that ending was just sub friggin' par. That's one thing that or AEW really needs to work on. Finishes? Well, their production value. Uh -huh. Getting their production value up... To the t uh, well, now you, they don't even got to get close to WWE. They just have to like meet at like meet in the middle somewhere because the guerrilla style that they do to a certain extent is great. For me, production on the side of WWE, every match production wise looks like it's the same. It's process. And AEW, you can <clears throat> see where matches matter. Well, but like that, the well, Sting cinematic match with Darby Allen. No, that's good. If they gave everybody that kind of shit, I mean, what could you say well, bad about it? No, no, no. And this is what I'm saying, dude. In terms of the production value, when they do stuff like that, it's mm -hmm. great. But their live matches. That, that's one right. thing I will say. When they is care, that their though, camera angles it's laid out better. No, that's if good. it's the main event, the main thing <clears> that's going on you're going to see the quality of their product elevated. But when it's like a mid-card match or like, you know, a storyline like the one you were talking about with Moxley and Eddie Kingston, it was yeah. a big deal, but it's not CM Punk and Daniel Bryan, and it's a bit lazier, it seems. To a certain extent. They don't, like, know exactly where the cameras need to be and shit like they do and with the big... And this is one match. thing I'll say. I think the biggest thing was back then, a lot of, like, the wrestling finishes were being called by the executive vice presidents. Mm -hmm. You know, the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Cody, all of them used to have calls and like how the matches would finish. Now they don't anymore. Now it's solely on Tony Khan. In which, that's good. I think he, in his taking over of like booking the matches, AEW's only gotten better. He has nothing but uh, foresight into the, com the company winning, not yes. a personal spot for himself. His, yes. his spot's secured. Oh, yeah. So I think that's a great idea because when you got people who are currently wrestling trying to run the show also, mm. like even me, myself, with certain things with UCW, I pull myself back. Yeah. Because I want to see what everybody else has in mind. Because my thoughts, you know, are always going to be self-interested to a certain degree if I'm involved. Well, yeah, and as much as you, and, and here's the thing, you really need, like, a fixed perspective on things of someone who's, like, not in the show to a certain yes. extent 
to get the best out of it. Someone who's not a wrestler. Yes. Who has nothing to gain but money from the show being good. And and I think Tony Khan, what he's going to argue for here soon because of the fact that AEW has so much, so many people on their roster, he's going to argue that Rampage and uh, and Dynamite get an extra hour apiece. In which I'd be down for that <clears throat> because there are so many people who are underutilized on AEW's roster that definitely deserve to be in a more prime spotlight. I'm going to say something that might be a little bit controversial, but it's honestly how I feel. There are way, way too many people on in these companies. And yeah, yeah that is good that they get a chance. It's great that, that they make big those money. big wrestling companies are flourishing and everything. But I would way rather go be like a champion and have big storylines in a small company than be a curtain jerker at AEW or anywhere else. That's fair. And a lot of them that are just sitting there like waiting for their opportunity could be doing exactly what the Young Bucks did Mm. right now and building their own companies and building their own brand to be beyond what anyone else will ever push them to be. Yeah. Well, again, it's just... It's too much. Two hours of wrestling is too much. It's all way, way too fucking much. I think with the right... The right pacing, I think, two hours could be done properly. But again, I think you have to have the roster, and you have to have the writing for it. It's my opinion, and my opinion is that, you know, the writing isn't there. Mm. The the compelling storylines, the larger-than-life characters, and the stuff that makes you want to invest it isn't there. There's mm-hmm. a lot of incredibly talented athletic individuals who can do a lot of really cool things mm-hmm. and are athletic specimens but are very boring as in, about as interesting <laughs> as a as a cardboard cutout and and there's a lot of athletic talented good looking people a lot of them <clears throat> but, but very few of them have the charisma to back it up at if all, any. at all, and uh, and they don't they don't think that's true. They think they're charismatic, and they're not. They think because they can do a two peso tope suicida and land on their feet, and that's because charisma. they're attractive, and everyone has catered to them their entire lives, and that they're not used they to being told they're that they're not good at anything. You know, you tell them, "Hey, you are charismatic. You could be in a, a high school musical or a local theater and do great." But yeah. as a superstar on television, you are not. Just That's, like Roman Reigns, dude. Look at Roman Reigns back, you know, back in like the run of like the run that basically made him like the most hated man in wrestling. Days of our lives missed the mark with that guy. They could have done a lot with him. They could have. But now he's doing his best work as the tribal chief. And I think and I'm glad that they're doing it. But for me and for a lot of people out there in the wrestling world, a few years too late. Yeah. Anyway. This business of professional wrestling is not always that, which leads us to ask, who is the most unprofessional wrestler and why is it the ghost of 90s Shawn Michaels? Lots of wrestlers have lost their minds and tried to injure their opponents in the ring, which makes no sense. It's very unprofessional, but we already did a whole list on that. So you be professional and go and watch that for the sake of not boring you fine folk with repeating content, which is why the Montreal Screwjob, JBL beating up the Blue Meanie at One Night Stand 2005, The Rock nearly killing Mick Foley at the Royal Rumble. Oh. Hulk Hogan at Summer Slam, Perry Satin beating up the job as they already fell in love with a f***ing mop. They won't be on this list, we promise. Please leave us alone. Instead, we're talking about other moments of wrestlers being deeply, deeply unprofessional. And it turns out there's there's just loads more we could talk about. Kind of makes you sad, really. I'm Adam Hayley. Hey, <laughs> 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 I love that photo. Do you know what's really yeah. unprofessional? Not subscribing to Parts Fun Known. Do, do it please Already thank have. you number 10 charlotte flair drops the belt oh. well what in the blooming hell was this how do you make a championship exchange segment even more unwatchable this is how all right context charlotte flair was raw women's champion becky lynch was smackdown women's champion both were drafted to opposite brands because wwe simply can't help themselves a championship exchange was scheduled for the main event of smackdown so the two champions can make sure their prop belts were color coordinated the plan was for becky lynch to grab charlotte's belt and to 
declare herself Becky two belts as she'd done at WrestleMania 35. But Charlotte decided she wasn't gonna have that. Charlotte went against the script, pulling away from Lynch and dropping the belt to the mat. Charlotte wasn't done causing a ruckus on this night as when Sasha Banks came out for her part in the segment, Charlotte once again went off script, interjecting and putting some heat back on herself. This all led to a heated confrontation between Lynch and Flair backstage with Charlotte being escorted out of the building. Again, it's just, yeah. it's a sad situation. And what the blooming hell? Number nine, Bret Hart's sunny day. Shawn Michaels may be the yeah. biggest disturber WWE has ever had in the main event scene. There could be any number of 90s HBK moments on this list. His tantrum during his match with Vader at SummerSlam 96, keeping a lollipop in his mouth while Ken Shamrock had him in the ankle lock. All those times he wore those shorts all come to mind, but the creme de la creme of show-stopping douchebaggery has to be his infamous Sunny Days comment aimed yeah. at Bret Hart. Enough has been said about Bret and Sean's personal rivalry, but when you make a public comment on Raw insinuating that Hart was having an affair with Sunny, causing him great stress with his home life, perhaps you've achieved your place as the most unprofessional oh, wrestler, wrestler Sean. Sean. Especially because apparently Sean Michaels was the one having Sunny Days, but that's, that's just... Actually, he was. That's the thing. Sean attributed that to Brett, but it was actually Sean. Before or after the Vancey days? Oh, I would say... <laughs> mm, I'd say before, probably. Probably at the same time. Who knows? Well, I mean, honestly, she was cheating on Chris Candido the entire time with half the locker room. Sonny admits this. She's like, yeah, I was a whore. Still am, to a certain extent. <laughs> That, that's a legend. Number eight, Austin Aries walks out of Bound for Glory. Oh, classic example. Oh, Austin dude. Aries has certainly developed a reputation for being... And that's a, the thing. I used to love Austin Aries. The guy is a great worker. Yeah, but how are you going to do this Fuck. to Johnny Wrestling, man? That's the guy that had nothing to do with the problems. No. Nothing to do with the problems. Dude. And I've met him. I've got to cut a promo with the guy. I've been around him in the locker room. Treated me... I mean, we only had a brief interaction, but he had every right to be yeah. like, why is this guy in the promo? Just get him the fuck out of here. John, and yeah. he didn't. He was all about it. I said a couple of things. You know, we the, it, it was all good, man. For those of you who don't know what he's talking, who he's talking about, Johnny Morrison. John, John Morrison, Morrison, yeah. Johnny Mundo, Johnny Impact, Johnny Nitro, yeah. All that. Yeah. John Hennigan. The, Chad met him. And Great guy. Everything Chad yeah. said, he is the nicest guy. Nicest guy. I mean, he had already been on Survivor. He had already done all of this shit, you know, yeah. and, and was just cool as hell. Yeah. And he'd proven himself as a more than viable Oh, like, God. He had been multiple WWE. time world champion. Yeah. You know, in, mon in a bunch of companies that are well respected. If, if it weren't for, like, certain people at the top, Batista, mm -hmm. I mean, I love Dave Batista, but... He's the reason why Johnny, uh, you know, John Morrison got basically booted out of the company right before he was about to have a title run. Mm. Because Batista was fucking Molina. Yeah, that happened. Ad difficult to work with. He's been in and out of nearly every top promotion in the United States. And in 2018, he found himself in Impact Wrestling as Impact World Champion. After losing the title to Johnny Mundo Morrison Hennigan Nitro Impact in the main event of Bound for Glory 2018, Aries popped to his feet, completely no selling the finish to the match, spit at Morrison before yelling obscenities towards the Impact top brass, flipping them off, and storming out of the promotion never to return. There were many who thought this was a work where Aries would return to the promotion no. at a later date. But here we are with the clock having ticked past three years, and it doesn't seem he's coming back. Number seven, Randy Orton is stupid. Imagine the alternate stupid. timeline where Kofi Mania took place at WrestleMania 26. If only he hadn't forgotten the finish of this one match. Kofi's supposed to stay down, get punted by Randy Orton, but he forgot and stumbled to his feet. Unfortunately for him, this small mistake basically killed his entire push, a money in the bank win at Mania because- Again, Randy Orton flexing his nuts Trying to pretend he knows what's best for wrestling. Holding talent back. Don't get me wrong. When people forget finishes to the match every now and again. You know, things get lost in translation. Shit happens. Him doing this to Kofi was wrong. What he did to Mr. Kennedy was wrong. A lot of things that Randy Orton has done has just been wrong. God, dude. Ego. And I get it. You're you're tall, six foot five. You're the Viper. You've been handed the Legend Killer moniker. You know, because you beat all these legends, and you got that, the, you know, that whole thing. But, dude, you, you make a great heel, Randy, but you could, you got to stop being an asshole <laughs> in real life. I mean, Jesus. 
Randy Orton hit a particularly frustrated RKO on him before yelling stupid. Of course, Randy could have stupid. just reminded Kofi of the spot and then hit it. Not sure throwing a fit on camera and killing the biggest push of a young talent was entirely necessary. Orton has had of course it was, because it made him win the championship. Years, flipping off the fans at Night of Champions 2011, giving the old space ball salute at Hell in a Cell 2009, and taking a big swing at Mr. Kennedy after Kennedy dropped him on the back of his head accidentally. Although that one's maybe a bit more understandable what happened after it wasn't though go oh, randy please don't kill me number six <laughs> oklahoma well here is some oh. Oh. if i could head but ed ferrara i this pan down worst like insults like to one of the greatest people in the wrestling industry ever dude jim ross after suffering from bell's palsy and cancer by the way <clears throat> which i've had bell's palsy and i don't know if you've all noticed but you know I'm able to move this side, this side of my mouth very good. Not so much over here. It's because Bell's palsy, guys. Shit sucks. Anyway. There is quality heel heat, and then there is mean-spirited trash like this. Jim Ross is a talented and well-respected man in general. Furthermore, he was an executive and commentator for WWE and not at all relevant to what was happening on WCW in 1999 when Ed Ferrara went out on Nitro doing a highly disrespectful impression of Ross called Oklahoma, complete with a scrunched-up face and southern accent. Ferrara mocked Ross's Bell's palsy, which had recently nearly ended his career, because that is a super cool thing to do to another human being that, again, has nothing to do with your f***ing TV show. The whole thing is just gross. Ferrara and Vince Russo had come from WWE where they had butted heads with Ross because, well, Ross understands wrestling and Russo checks notes didn't. This is peak unprofessional behavior in WCW, which was the meeting place of the Unprofessional Wrestlers Coalition. See also Bash at the Beach 2000. Number five, Bob Holly beats up Matt Capitelli. The more barbaric ways of wrestling training seem to be a thing of the past. That is a good thing with the horror stories you hear from wrestlers of generations past. The hazing culture of wrestling saw many trainers break the bones of their trainees just to make the point of you need to be, quote, tough, quotes enough to make it in the business. While wrestling is very difficult, yes, virtually everyone involved in the third season of Tough Enough agreed that Bob Holly's treatment of Matt Capitelli was incredibly excessive. Holly was described as being stressed following his broken neck and took out his aggression on Capitelli, who had spent that day being excessively jovial in training. A true crime in WWE locker rooms. <laughs> How dare he? Holly decimated Capitelli, booting him in the jaw and again in the eye, leaving his face bruised, bloody and swollen. It is incredibly gross and a remnant of a past generation that belongs in the past. Number four, Wendy Richter versus the Spider Lady. The Montreal Ooh. screw job could very easily be on this list and falls under the category of everything Shawn Michaels did in the 90s and also the category of things we talk about way too much. This one, on the other hand, can make an appearance because, well, it is the original screw job. After yeah. All. Vince McMahon wanted to get the WWF Women's Championship off Wendy Richter because she started asking questions about why she wasn't being paid similar to Hulk Hogan. And obviously, you've just got to go at that point. See also Ultimate Warrior. To get the title off her, Vince put the fabulous Moolah in a full bodysuit calling her the Spider Lady. To this day, I'm not sure how you could wrestle a match with 62-year-old Fabulous Moolah and not know it was her, but I digress. In a more traditional screw job where the audience isn't supposed to know that any tomfoolery was taking place, Moolah pinned Richter and did not let her up before being unmarked and then sort of just wandering away and everything is really awkward and bad. This is also totally unnecessary and by today's standards, it's ridiculous that these measures had to be taken where you could just, I don't know, pay your top women's star better because you're like, <laughs> you're putting her in all the cartoons. Just don't be a dick. Yeah. Number three, Eva Lise versus Thunder Rosa. Eva Ooh. Lise is a pretty damn good wrestler oh, that collects yeah. drama like a seagull collects chips from unsuspecting tourists. Stories of backstage conflict involving Eva Lise have abounded in promotions including Shine, Lucha Underground, WCPW, but the most public being the heat surrounding her departure from AEW. Eva Lise was released from the company in April this year after backstage fallout and ill feeling, some of which stemmed all the way back to a match months before between Eva Lise and Thunder Rosa on the September 16th. 16th episode of Dynamite. The match was mostly great and very hard hitting, although it's since come out that the reason why it was so stiff was that both women were displeased after Evelise objected to Rosa being the one to lead the match. For the most part, the beef is hidden or at least disguised as kayfabe violence, but there's no hiding one moment of obvious unprofessionalism from Evelise. Rosa rolls her to the mat where Evelise just sits there, pissed off, wiping the hair from her eyes, almost shrugging, just waiting to be put in a full Nelson. A kayfabe shattering display. Number two, New Jack versus Master. Oh, no. 
Rest in peace, New Jack. But damn, dude, oh, you scary. Rest in peace, Mass Transit, dude. Yeah, I mean, both of them, Jesus dude. Christ. Jack's appeared on a whole bunch of our list of wrestlers doing just the worst things, mostly for his horrifying attack on Vic Grimes. But by golly, he does this sort of thing so much, it still necessitates a spot on this one, specifically for the equally horrific Mass Transit incident. The infamous story goes that Eric Kulas lied about his age, falsified his documentation to get booked on an ECW show yeah. as a replacement for Axel Rotten, working under the name Mass Transit. In reality, the 17-year-old was not trained and went to the ring to wrestle New Jack, which is the wrestling equivalent of an overzealous teenager climbing into a tiger <laughs> exhibit at the local zoo to check Pretty his much. fucking dental work. Also, the tiger might have been nicer than New Jack. Mass Transit was going to bleed in the match, and New Jack took the liberty of taking care of that for him, cutting his head with an X-Acto knife. The whole match saw New Jack and ECW being taken to court for assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. If that doesn't scream, not a professional, then I don't know what does. And number one, Victory Road. Oh. Jeff Hardy is oh, the Jeff most hard conquered of his famous demons, except that really Damn. weird one has a kink for umbrellas. But there's no two ways about it. Wrestling is really f***ing dangerous at the best of times when everyone's on the ball oh, doing the, the job to the best oh, of their abilities. Yeah. Accidents can still happen that carry disastrous consequences. Yeah. So showing up to wrestle intoxicated is pretty much the most unprofessional thing a wrestler can do. Alicia Fox showed up too inebriated to perform at a WWE house show and that was really bad. Alberto El Patron once showed up to a WCPW show drunk and had to be pulled from the card at the last minute. Can confirm I was there, but Jeff yeah. Hardy showed up to wrestle in the main event of a TNA pay-per-view, visibly far gone, in no shape to compete, and it tops them all. At Victory Road 2011, Jeff Hardy was set to face Sting, but got high, drunk, or both backstage. He stumbled down to the ring, so clearly out of Damn. it, the referee Earl Hebner almost immediately threw up the X. Eric Bischoff came out to stall for time because everyone was panicking. Sting was forced to pin Jeff Hardy hard way amidst cries of bull****, to which Sting responds on I camera, agree. I, I agree. agree. No one yeah. really looks good from this story, not Jeff not Dixie Carter, who refused backstage to pull the match. It's just a really sad day for unprofessional wrestling. And that's our list. What do you consider to be the most unprofessional moment in- Throwing the brick. That one. Ooh. The guy that threw the brick mm, in Mexico. Juan Cena. <sighs> now he lived. He's okay. But this guy got fucked up. I'm talking about- they had to save his life. Yes. I want you all to see this. This is supposed to be staged. This is a hardcore match in Lucha. In Lucha. This is an actual cinder block. Yeah, and a nobody and some young guy with talent. Yes. That's what Boom. was really going on here. That motherfucker wanted to take him out of the business. This guy showed up here to do this match and was not a regular here. This guy was known in the locker room. Yeah. He was loved in the locker room. There's some things that has been said that I disagree with, but one thing I will say is, if that shit happens at a UCW show... Oh, dude, yeah. Ha the entire locker room will come out this man and is will fucked. fucking yeah, this, destroy this man whoever does it. This man fucked for yes. doing this. I mean, that's when you take care of business for real. You gotta you gotta take that trash And so you go out. out there with a baseball bat and ba break his fucking... Make his Break his fucking elbow. It's, it's got to be real. I'm I sorry, dude. Work. Hard way. That's the most unprofessional thing I've ever seen. Yeah. The other one uh, I would say is... Uh, the two one. Japanese chicks? Yeah. When the or big the one... one beat the shit out of the little one? Yeah, the little one kept yeah. fighting, but, you know, she lost sight in her left yeah. eye, dude. But anyway, we're going to move on, everyone. This was Parts Fun Known. Uh, <laughs> hopefully you all enjoyed, and hopefully we will see you all in the next one. So until then, I'm Nate. I'm Chad. We'll see you, everybody. Peace out.